Jesus told a Samaritan woman, if you knew who I was and you asked me for a drink, I would give you a drink and you would thirst no more. And to those of us who have tasted and seen, we say amen. We're gonna be in Psalm 42 and 43 this morning. If you're a guest, like Jeffrey already mentioned, we are so grateful that you are here. We would love it if you would come by the coffee shop, myself, other pastors and staff members will be there to meet you. We'd love to give you that gift, say hello, hear a little bit about your story. If you're watching online, please drop us a comment, let us know where you're watching from, or maybe how we can be praying for you. We would love to serve you in that way. So Psalm 42 and 43, are two separate psalms, but they actually belong together as we're going to see by their shared topic and the recurring refrain that is found in Psalm 42, verse five, verse 11, and then again in Psalm 43, verse five. And when they combine, they make a song that has three stanzas. It's a difficult psalm, it's a heavy psalm, but it's a good psalm. And I'm very excited for us to walk through this together this morning. My most favorite novel that I've ever read is the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. I've shared that with some of you recently, uh, but it is a book that I encourage everyone to take advantage of. If you have not read this book, you should. If it's been a while since you've read the book, you should go back and read it again. Uh, There are several different versions that you can enjoy Two that I would highly recommend. First is, uh, it's a copy that's made for children. Uh, It's by Lethos Kids. Megan and I have actually walked our kids through this story. It's called Little Pilgrim's Big Journey. There it is on the screen. Uh, You can get this on Amazon or or in a bookstore. Uh, It is so good for discipling children and planting seeds of truth. I highly, highly recommend that. Uh, And then for uh, adults or teenagers, I would highly recommend this amazing copy that B&H Publishing has put out. It comes along with reflection questions and complementing passages of scripture to help you better understand uh, the allegories presented in the story because it's an allegory or an illustration of the Christian life that takes believers from the point of conversion all the way to the gates of the celestial kingdom. It is so good. And to encourage you to read it, I'm actually gonna share a story from Pilgrim's Progress this morning because it also is highly relatable to Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, all right? So in Pilgrim's Progress, the main character, whose name is Christian, is on a path, the narrow way, seeking the celestial kingdom. And on this journey, he has his friend, Hopeful. Him and Hopeful have come to a place on the path where it's extremely rocky, there's lots of tree roots, and their feet are sore from all of their travels. And so they're beginning to complain that the narrow way is too difficult. This is too hard. Well, they look over a stone wall and on the other side of the stone wall, they see a beautiful meadow. And they reason together that it would be easier to walk through the meadow than on the narrow way. And the meadow doesn't stay straight too far from the narrow way. So they haven't actually left the king's highway like they were told not to do. Well, after they leave the king's highway, and after they've entered into the meadow, they're captured by a giant named Despair. This giant takes the two men and throws them in the dungeon of Doubting Castle. The dungeon is cold, it's damp, it smells of death. In the dungeon, giant Despair beats the two men ruthlessly. He beats them with a tree limb. He shows them the bones of those who he has captured before them. He mocks their faith in their God. God can't see you here. Your king has forgotten you. What's the point of living? What's the point of living if life is filled with nothing but misery? Give up, end yourselves. Well, later that night, giant despair is asleep and the two men begin to talk to each other. Christian is hurting. He's wounded. And he's ready to give up in despair of all life. But his friend Hopeful reminds him of all the past battles that God had brought him through. God had never abandoned Christian, not once. So why would he fail him now? And after further conversation, Christian remembered that he had been given a key called promise. 
He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out the key. He puts it into his shackles and he turns the key and with a click, it releases. The two men then sneak to the dungeon door. And while it requires a little more effort, the dungeon door opens to them. They then sneak through the courtyard and they get to the castle gate. And again, the key of promise opens another blockade, allowing the men to escape to freedom. Every Christian has received the key of promise that has been given to us to dismantle the lies of the enemy. Lies that the enemy would prefer us to believe so that we will not enjoy our Savior, so that we will not walk in freedom, and so that we will live a life bound, gagged. This brings us to Psalm 42 and 43 this morning. The words will be on the screen, or you can follow along with me in your copy of God's Word as we study these psalms together. The psalmist, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God, with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. Well, they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend me against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. This is the word of the Lord. The writer of these psalms is in a very difficult season of life. He doesn't provide a lot of information for us to tell us what has brought him to where he's at, but he does give us some insight. We know that he's far away from home. We know that he misses the community of God's people. We know that he's being attacked and wrongly accused by the enemies of God. He's also very transparent about his emotions. He can't eat. He can't sleep. Day and night, he weeps. So every person in this room, on some level, can relate to this psalmist. All of us, in some way, have experienced suffering. Some of us are walking through very difficult seasons right now. Some of us are in a season of peace. And some of us are suffering from lack of light. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's this internal struggle that's taking place, right? So the psalmist is wrestling. And in verse one, he compares his situation to that of a wild animal that craves after water. But it's not just that he's lacking water. He's also expending everything that's within him. 
In fact, I would compare this rightly to dehydration. There's an internal struggle brought on by an external reality. It's hot, and when it's hot, I'm gonna sweat. And the longer I sweat without drinking water, my body is going to deplete itself of fluids. This is a very dangerous circumstance to find yourself in if you don't have the ability to replenish those fluids. The longer I go without water, the more depleted my fluids become, I'm going to suffer in several different ways, two of which my thought processing is going to be limited. My motor skills are going to be inhibited. And so I'm going to think in ways and act in ways that do not profit me and in fact may harm myself and others. This is very similar to spiritual dehydration. The longer I suffer without drinking of the living water of God, I'm going to think untrue things about God and I'm going to act in ways that may harm myself and others. An example that we have of incorrect thinking is found in verse two of Psalm 42. The psalmist says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, this is not a rejection of the reality that God is omnipresent, but it's an acknowledgement, at least at this time, in a unique and special way that God has caused his presence to dwell with Israel at the temple, while at the same time being omnipresent. However, the incorrect thinking that the psalmist has is that because he is not in Jerusalem, is that somehow he's been cut off from the blessings of God. God is fully capable of causing his presence to dwell with his people in Jerusalem while also caring for all of his people wherever they find themselves. But the psalmist is believing that somehow, some way, he's been removed from this. Another example of the psalmist thinking incorrectly is found in verse four. Look there with me. The psalmist continues on. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. This sweet memory is a good one, but it's turned into an idol of comfort. The psalmist who is away from home, who is missing the community of believers that he enjoyed, missing the gathering of worship, is looking back on this and saying, that's the season I belong in. This is wrong. Where you have me right now, I don't belong here. God, you've got to fix this. You had it right when I was in Jerusalem. You had it right when I was leading the multitude in worship. But here, now, this, this is what you've given me? And so the psalmist is complaining. Now, the only right response to combat incorrect feelings and thoughts about God is for believers to preach the gospel to themselves. This is what the psalmist does. Now, he has been honest about his pain, he has expressed his thoughts, he's brought his complaints to God, but now he begins to preach to himself because he understands that no matter how hard life gets, the power of God given to us in his word will ultimately lead us to victory in Christ Jesus. And so in verse five, he says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This thing over here is just driving me nuts. <laughs> the reality of the gospel determines the reality of our lives, not our circumstances. It is easy, though, for us to look at our current circumstances and for us to believe that this is my reality. This is where I have found myself. This defines who I am but it is the gospel that defines that, which is why Christians can find hope in all kinds of circumstances. 
Now the psalmist is battling, he's struggling, he's being honest and vulnerable about his emotions and his feelings before God. And so he continues on. Not only does his soul feel deprived, he also has a desperate heart. Look at verse six. Verse six reminds us again that he's far from home. And so the consistent disruption that he's experiencing in his routine is adding to his turmoil. We can experience the same thing. In fact, this is why I love camp. You take a bunch of middle school and high school students and you disrupt the space that they live in and the pace that they live at and you force them to look intently on God and big things happen. But that's not isolated to camp. Do you live in a space and at a pace that doesn't make room for God? Do you neglect drinking of the living water? Life is difficult enough. Are you increasing your suffering by not pursuing the fountain of life that we have in Christ Jesus? The psalmist feels the weight of this. He's struggling, he's wrestling through the pain. The weight of life is pressing him down. In verse seven, the writer describes this as an overwhelming waterfall or the breaking of waves. But he attributes this work to the Lord as a mercy, as a grace. Sometimes training in righteousness hurts. When I discipline my children positively, meaning they haven't disobeyed, they haven't done anything wrong, but I'm forcing them to practice self-control, or I'm forcing them to practice patience, or I'm forcing them to practice generosity, it's hard for them. It's difficult. All of us have experienced this in some way as we were raised, being forced to discipline ourselves in different forms. God, too, loves his children, and he disciplines us for our good, training us in righteousness, training us to walk with him. And the psalmist recognizes this, recognizes that God is doing something in the midst of this difficult season, trying to draw him closer to himself. Look at verses seven and eight. He says, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. So the waterfalls and the breakers, they belong to God. They are under his control. He's not literally in the depths of waters, but the refinement that he's experiencing feels as though wave after wave is crashing on him. When the psalmist writes that the Lord commands his steadfast love, he's speaking of the never-ending covenant that God has made with his people. While life is hard, the psalmist knows that God has not abandoned him. And if he hasn't abandoned him, that means that God hasn't abandoned the covenant. This is an encouragement that we have as followers of Christ. God is committed to his glory. And part of him being committed to his glory is finishing the good work that he began in us. If the enemies of God can look and point and say, see, you couldn't bring them through. You couldn't make them more like Jesus. You couldn't free them. You couldn't change them. Then he isn't who he says he is but all of us have experienced him in different ways and we continue to experience him now knowing that God is indeed just as faithful and present as he was the day that he saved us. Now in Philippians chapter two, verses, excuse me, chapter two, Philippians four, verses 12 to 13, Paul writing to the church in Philippi tells them that he's learned how to endure any and all circumstances. He says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So whether it's the disruption of routines or even being confined to our deathbed, we can endure through Christ. He is with us and he is for us wherever we are in our life journey and wherever we are on the spectrum of suffering. And in him and through him, we overcome. 
Psalm 23, verse five, tells us that God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies and that he anoints our head with oil and causes our cup to overflow. Think about the context that David wrote this in. David wrote this talking about the valley of the shadow of death. And it's in this valley, in the brokenness, in the pain that God meets us and prepares a table for us to feast on his faithfulness, on his power, on his grace, on his love, on his mercy, and the enemies cannot rob us of it. We may not know what God is doing in the present, but we can look back and be confident in what he has accomplished. God is with us and he is for us. Verse nine, the psalmist continues, he says, I say to God, my rock, Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? The psalmist is experiencing conflicting thoughts simultaneously. Ever been there? Ever in one breath said, God, I love you. And on the other hand said, I don't get what you're doing. This is the psalmist. On one hand, he's expressed confidence in God by preaching the gospel to himself. He's acknowledged that God is permitting him to suffer only what he can endure through Christ. And he's found comfort knowing that God has not abandoned his covenantal promise towards him. But on the other hand, he feels forgotten, left to the oppression of the enemy. Pain so great that he feels it deep within his body, like the aching in his bones. And now the enemy begins to taunt his faith in God. But the primary target of this attack isn't actually the psalmist. The enemy is attempting to undermine the character of God. Because in the face of suffering, if we do not trust the character of God to be who he has promised to be, who he has proven to be, we will not trust what he is doing. We'll question him. We'll doubt him. We'll run from him. We'll avoid him. The psalmist's heart is so tempted to fail, so tempted to run from confidence in God that he begins to preach the gospel once again to himself. He returns to the refrain of his lament because he knows that no matter how hard life gets, the power of God given to us in his word will sustain us to victory in Jesus. He preaches once again in verse 11, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Remember, circumstances do not determine our reality. The gospel does. And so when we find ourselves in the face of suffering and loss and heartache, preach the gospel to yourself. Look intently to the one who has saved you, to the one who is in control of all things. Well, this brings us to Psalm 43, and we're going to see a major shift in momentum. So the writer has been cast down. He's struggling. He's still in a dark place. He's still in a hard place, but he's rejecting the enemy's lies, and he has repeatedly preached the gospel to himself. But he has one last hurdle to overcome, before he experiences victory, discouragement. So his soul feels deprived, he feels desperation in his heart and discouragement in his mind. God's character is no longer the target of the attacks of the enemy now. Now the enemy moves to accusing the character of the psalmist. He tried to cause the psalmist to doubt in the character of God, to doubt his faithfulness, to doubt his presence and his power and so on. And when the psalmist didn't turn from that, now he starts to attack and accuse falsely the psalmist. In the very beginning, the psalmist is crying out in the first two verses, says, vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression 
of the enemy. The psalmist is asking God to vindicate him. He's not asking for well-formed arguments. He's not asking for eloquent words. He's not even asking for God to give him favor in approaching these people. He's asking God himself to change the posture of their heart towards him because he knows that God is in control of all things. Proverbs chapter 16, verse seven tells us that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The psalmist is running to the one who can provide comfort in the face of adversity, to the one who can provide peace in the midst of chaos. He knows where his hope lies, even though he is surrounded right now by turmoil and suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Peter writing here says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. I have shared this with college students and young adults how many of us find ourselves in difficult circumstances because we repeatedly try to exalt ourselves? We try to advance our position. We try to convince people of an argument. We try to advance a relationship. And the scary thing is we can actually be successful. But at what cost? If we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and we trust him in every circumstance, he will exalt us, he will advance us in a way that brings glory to him and also provides us the victory. So in any and every circumstance that we find ourselves, we should humble ourselves and turn to our God. Now, despite experiencing small victories, like I said, the writer is still in the pit Verse two of Psalm 43, again, he's crying out, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Have you ever been in a place where you felt like God was just ignoring your prayers, rejecting your cries, like, don't you see me hurting? Don't you see me suffering? Why aren't you helping? What are you doing? What is your plan? God invites us to be honest and raw with those emotions. There's a difference between complaining about God and complaining to God. It's like gossip. If I go behind someone's back and I talk about them, that's not a good thing. That's wicked. But if I go to my brother or sister and I bring my complaint to them, there's the opportunity for reconciliation. Now, when I bring my complaint to God, be certain, God does not need to be brought into reconciliation with us, but he does bring our hearts and our minds into a proper understanding of what he is doing. And so God invites us to be raw and honest with where we are with how we feel and what we need. And the psalmist begins to preach truth because he knows that the truth of God dominates the truth of the enemy. Look at verses three and five. The psalmist continues to write. He says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling." Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. No matter how hard life gets, the power of God given to us in his word will lead us and sustain us to victory in Jesus Christ. The psalmist knows this. But what's exciting about this section of the psalm is that he's come to a place where he recognizes, if you lead me with your truth, I will return to you and worship and praise you fully with a joyful heart. And he's not talking about going to Jerusalem. 
in the valley of the shadow of death, in the midst of the chaos, among the attacks of the enemy, he will, in the face of adversity, continue to worship his God because he knows that God will lead him, he will guide him, and he will sustain him. And he will do the same for us. In the dungeon of doubt, Christian wanted to despair. And his friend Hopeful reminded him of God's faithfulness. And as he thought about God's faithfulness, he remembered they had the key of promise. And the key of promise is the gospel because the gospel determines our reality, not our circumstances. Now in closing, I wanna give you some practical steps to identify and to combat spiritual depression. I've called it for the sake of the text, I called it spiritual dehydration But really what this psalmist is wrestling with, if we're honest, is depression. He is in a very dark, broken place. He feels abandoned. He's far from home. He doesn't understand what God is doing. Everything seems to be against him. And it is a real thing that all Christians experience from time to time. Some of us are more inclined towards feelings of melancholy. Doesn't make you more wicked, It just means that that's how you are. That's the way that you've been designed. Some of us are more glass half full type people, but all of us at some point and in some way experience emotions that feel so overwhelming at times that they can cause us to think incorrectly about God and incorrectly about ourselves. So first, let's identify spiritual depression. First, like the psalmist, ask the Holy Spirit to examine you. Is it possible that you have unrepentant sin in your life? It could be sin that you have deliberately acted on. It could be sin that you have ignorantly committed. But if it has not been repented of, if it continues to persist and has not been put to death, it can dramatically affect and impact your emotional and physical well-being. You're a spiritual creature that God designed to be in a personal relationship with him. Sin disrupts that. Run from it. Ask the Holy Spirit to examine you. Second, just like the psalmist, ask yourself why you're downcast. Have you been offended by a friend or a family member? Have you recently experienced some kind of loss? Have you suffered disappointment? Are there unmet expectations? Have you undergone a major life transition, such as a high school graduation or out-of-state move, a change of careers, aging parents, retirement, or loss of independence? I hope that covers everyone in this room. All of us, in some way, will experience life-altering um, life-altering experiences that shake up the ground and can temporarily take our eyes off of Jesus. doesn't mean that we're bad people. It means that we're normal people. We're normal people who experience hard things and can from time to time forget who we are in Christ and what he's accomplished on our behalf. Third, With God's help, consider how how you have been responding to suffering. Are you acting out for attention? Expressions of anger, seclusion, reckless behavior can all be attempts to express the depth of our pain, but they fail to communicate correctly our experience. Christian didn't remain silent. Christian talked to his friend. And when he talked to Hopeful, Hopeful set his mind right. Not by giving him some pretty sayings, but by pointing him back to the faithfulness of God. We all need a hopeful in our life and all of us need to be a hopeful to someone else. Are you seeking comfort in substances, possessions, or relationships? It is a wicked, wicked thing that there are pathways out there that seek to promise comfort from suffering. 
They take advantage of our vulnerabilities. They take advantage of our frailty. But those things do not provide ultimate healing. It's like a really bad Band-Aid that keeps falling off. And we have to return to it over and over and over again. I mentioned possessions. Is it not strange to you that a new shirt will give you confidence? That's evil. Our confidence is in God. There are things out there that don't want us to hope and to rest in our Savior. And some of us are captured by those things. Are you considering or acting on thoughts of self-harm? If this is you, if this is you, you need help. God loves you desperately. We love you. There's two avenues that I want to provide. First, there's a suicide prevention line. It's 988. Uh, I think it's gonna be on the screen. If that's you and you're having these thoughts and you're too embarrassed to come forward and to share that later on when we have a time of response, please call that number, get help. I hope that the Lord will bring you to a place where you can share that information with the person in front of you so they can receive you, love you, listen to you, carry the burden of life with you. Second, we also have an amazing ministry here called Celebrate Recovery. It meets on Wednesday nights in C244 at 7 p.m. Meals are always provided. Child care is always provided. If that is something that would benefit you, please reach out. Take advantage of this resource. All right. Now let's talk about combating spiritual depression. So we've looked at a little bit of identifying it. Let's think about now about combating it. So talk to someone. Talk to someone. Do not, do not remain silent as God has commanded us to bear the burdens of life with one another. We should do that willingly and joyfully. Remember, everyone needs a hopeful and all of us need to be a hopeful to someone else. Second, be honest with God about your feelings. God already knows how you feel and what you think. So don't think that you can hide it from him. God invites you to lay it on the table. I can tell you three weeks ago, I was up on the second floor of the C building having a very hard and honest conversation with God. I kicked a couch, I knocked over a couple of chairs. I hope that doesn't offend you. But I was being honest with God that life was difficult, that ministry was challenging and I didn't understand what he was doing. I need you to know that it is okay not being okay. And that in Christ, we find hope. And you can turn to him. You can be honest about your emotions. Third, read the Bible and pray even when it hurts. Remember, training in righteousness doesn't always feel good. But it will bless and benefit you. The word of God has the ability to heal us, to mend us, and to lead us to freedom. Force yourself to read and to pray even when it hurts. Before I go to the fourth point, let me give you a 3.5. I didn't write this down, but this is something I just thought of. Pastor Danny has been very transparent about his own struggles with anxiety about his use of anti-anxiety medication. Pastor Jeffrey, our family pastor, has been very honest with students about his own battle with depression. I've told you that I was throwing a holy temper tantrum on the second floor. Listen, it's okay not being okay, but also, if you are on antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication, praise God. That is a means of grace that God has provided. However, that is not your hope. So the only thing I would say to that is, don't get off of your prescription, keep taking it. 
but shift your heart towards the Lord. It's him who has to cause the medication to work, okay? And it's him who has provided it to you. And if it allows you to focus on the things of God, praise him for it. That is a good, good thing, all right? All right, fourth and final. Preach the gospel to yourself. I have said this several times throughout the sermon, and so there's a certain concern that that could just be colloquial and just a church pithy saying. So what does it mean to preach the gospel to yourself? Does that mean that you just, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, he was buried in a tomb and he rose from the dead? Well, yeah, certainly, but there are greater truths to those realities. So think about this. You were a sinner separated from God. But in the extreme mercy of God, he has made a way for you to be in relationship with him and to receive forgiveness. Christ has fully paid for your debt of sin on the cross. There is nothing left for you to pay. There's nothing left for you to bring. You come in faith. You are saved by faith. You are kept by faith. Do not make the word of God a law to yourself. Walk with him. Rest in him. Second, if you're in Christ, his righteousness covers you from head to toe. So if you're up to your eyeballs in a battle against sin, the father does not stand over you, beating you with a gavel until you get it together. He will not listen to the accusations of the enemy. Instead, he sees you as chosen, adopted, redeemed, an heir of his kingdom. He knows you and he loves you and he sees you in need of him, his power and his assistance, and he is more than willing to give it. Preach that to yourself. Through Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit to empower you to put sin to death. This is a dynamic difference between Christians and unbelievers. There are morally good people that are going to hell. Morally good people who do not know God and do not love him, but man, they are nice. The Christian has been significantly transformed and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, not just to do good things, but to recognize our sin and to put it to death as God has empowered us. Rest in him and preach that to yourself. Your sin does not hold you captive. It is a lie and you have the key of promise. And while life is hard, we have the promise of heaven. One day, no more tears, no more striving, no more conflict. We will live in unity and peace with one another and with our God. Preach that gospel to yourself time and time and time again because circumstances do not determine reality. The gospel does. The gospel is our reality. If you are in Christ Jesus, all these things are true to you and they are for you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're here today and you're listening to this, and you're thinking, man, I can relate to that psalmist. My life is so hard. There is so much pain. There is so much suffering. I feel like there's no hope. There's a God who knows you. There's a God who sees you and he wants you. He wants you and he wants all of the garbage that you're bringing along. And he will take that from you and he will give you a new life. He will change you and transform you into the likeness of his son and he will empower you to know him and to walk with him, to love people in their brokenness and to meet them in their pain. So that when the enemy tries to step, step to you and to tell you that you're a slave of sin and that you have no hope and that this is the end of life, you can preach back, no, I belong to the king. This morning, all of us in some way are carrying burdens. And we have a tendency in our Americanized culture to want to hold ourselves back because we don't want people to see us as weak. But we're told that the power of the gospel is made perfect in weakness. If you need prayer, come for prayer. If you need to hope in Christ for salvation, come for salvation. We would love to talk with you however God is working in your heart. Because the power of God given to us in his word is sufficient to carry us through whatever life throws at us. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we come to you confessing that we are hurting, that we carry burdens that we aren't fully transparent about. We come to you, Lord, asking that you would bring healing and mending to our souls. Lord, for the person in here that hasn't felt the freedom to be honest and open about their pain, would you give them boldness? Would you help them to take hold of the key of promise and to look to you? For the person that is far from you, but is looking in, recognizing that they need salvation, or would you draw them to yourself? Lord, I pray that you would make us a people who love one another, who carry one another's burdens and preach the gospel to one another. Lord, we need you for this. We trust you for this. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing.